Good morning. I'm grateful to be able to come back here and worship with you all again. I'm grateful for the elders and Mike for inviting me back to, to preach for you again. I know it's been a, a couple months since I was last here. And I want to get started by asking you all, have you ever made a New Year's resolution before? I, I'm just curious how, how that's going right now. Now, personally, I didn't grow up with that tradition in my family. We didn't really do New Year's resolutions where, you know, you start the new year off with setting goals for yourself to, to better yourself in some way. People often say, like, oh, new year, new me. So you're, you're kind of redefining yourself, trying to build new habits or break old ones. And so I saw that as a, a good opportunity. So a couple of years ago, in my, my junior year in college, I decided to uh, give my New Year's resolutions a shot. And so I, I started with some simple goals for myself that I wanted to work on. I wanted to, to eat better. Um, in college, my eating habits were very poor. And I wanted to eat at least three meals a day. I wanted to drink more water because I forgot to drink water quite a lot. And I wanted to start working out pretty consistently. And so I set, those, set out myself with those goals and things were going pretty well, and at first, at least. I was, I was eating much better, I was drinking more water, and I was starting to work out pretty consistently. And I had some friends who were helping me uh, stay consistent with those goals. But what happened was, is I started to slack a little bit and kind of cut corners. You know, I would allow myself to get way too busy in the day, going from one thing to another, and all of a sudden it'd be 1 a.m. and I hadn't eaten at all that day. Mm -hmm. Failed that goal. Or I, I had to wake up pretty early and I'd say to myself, oh, coffee has water in it, so that's good enough right there. Or, you know, I wake up sore after working out one day. I'm like, oh, I'll work out tomorrow. I'm too sore today. And then tomorrow comes and I say the exact same thing. And then all of a sudden, all of my goals have failed and I stopped working at any of them. And it got to the point when October came around and I was talking to one of my friends who was helping me out with my goals. And she told me, hey, how are your resolutions going? How's this been going? I'm like, what are you talking about? I completely forgot I had even set those goals for myself. That's how far I fell from sticking with what I set out to do that year. And now that's funny for New Year's resolutions. I know they're, they're infamous for that, where we set off well, we start strong, and they fall off throughout the year. But that pattern can continue with other parts of our life, more serious things that we're trying to work on, more spiritual things. And we, we want to make change in our lives. We see that deep down, spiritually, there are things we need to change, that we're unsatisfied with something, whether that's we have a sinful, bad habit that's stuck around for far too long, or maybe we're trying to build better habits. We're trying to read our Bible more, meditate, pray to God, things like that that we could all be working on. And we're trying to work on those things. We're trying to break habits or build habits. And yet we find ourselves constantly falling short and not reaching our goals. That could be very discouraging. That could be a very hard thing to deal with. And we could, it could cause us to, to quit altogether, just like I did with my, my New Year's resolutions. So the question this morning that I want to address is, what can we do better? How can we make lasting change? Change that doesn't just stick around for a little bit then go away, but change that really builds these habits or breaks our bad ones. How can we make lasting change in our lives? I want to look at James chapter 1 as a sort of like three-step plan on how to, to better ourselves spiritually and how to, how to make these lasting changes. I'm going to read from the same scripture reading we had earlier just to refresh it in our minds. So going over to James chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself 
goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. And so James gives us three things that we should all be working on to make these lasting changes, to break bad habits or build good ones. And the three steps I want us to look at is, number one, we need to be able to listen when we are confronted with something. Number two, we need to be able to let go of the things that are holding us back from accomplishing our goals. And the last thing is we need to put in the labor, put in the work to get these things done. And so my first point this morning, uh, making sure we are listening to uh, the confrontations that we are given, comes from this first part here, reading this again in verse 19, when James says, my brothers and sisters, understand this, everyone should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Now, there are going to be times in our lives where someone's going to come up to us and say, hey, I don't think you're doing this right. I think you're, you're falling short here. Or they might say to you, hey, I see you're putting in work, but I think you could be doing it better in this way. I think this can better help you along your path. There are people who genuinely want to help us, but what they say to us might be difficult and we might not want to hear it. But James tells us this, that we need to be able to listen. We need to be slow to anger, slow to speak, slow to react in that way, but quick to hear, open ourselves up to what people have to say, because there are people who are genuinely trying to help us. But the problem that often happens is we don't like to listen. Our, our reaction is often the opposite of what James says, that when we are confronted with a problem, when people point something out, we are quick to say something back in response, quick to snap back in some way, defend ourselves, maybe even get angry with that person for saying something. James says we need to do the opposite. We need to not get angry like that. We need to not be quick to speak, quick to snap back, but we need to be open-minded to what people have to say. We need to be quick to hear. And if we aren't able to do this, we are setting ourselves up on the wrong path. How we respond to confrontation determines the path that we set ourselves on to either better ourselves or stay complacent in where we are. And so we need to humble ourselves, as James says in a little bit, in order to listen. We need to see that we might have a problem. Maybe they see something that we don't and they're trying to help us. We need to be open-minded. And now I'm not saying to just listen to what anyone tells you ever, not to be so open-minded that your, your mind falls out, as I've heard some people put it. But you want to take what someone says and look at your life, reflect on it, listen to what they have to say, and see if it holds true to what's in uh, your life, how you've been acting. Take their word and compare it to your life and see if what they say is true and see if there's a problem you can work on and a better way to address it. Now, within the, uh, the New Testament, we have some examples that I want to look at of people who respond in both ways that we talked about, both in a good way and in a bad way. Over in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we have the, the first gospel sermon given by Peter. Now, Christ has already died and has been resurrected and has ascended, and he's left the, the job of starting the church, of preaching the gospel in the hands of his apostles. And we come to a time where it is Pentecost, a great feast for the Jewish people where they're all gathered together to celebrate this feast. And so Peter is preaching to a large crowd, a very diverse crowd, and this crowd is the very same crowd that had crucified Jesus just a few days prior. And Peter does not hold that back from them. He tells them that you are the ones who killed the Messiah that you had been waiting for. He goes through all these passages of prophecies talking about what was to come, what Jesus did for them, and they had killed them. He confronted them with a problem, told them something difficult, and what was their response to Peter's message? Let's look down at that. Over in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And so when they were confronted with their sin, confronted with a problem, what was their reaction? They listened to Peter. They were open-minded about it, and they were pierced to the heart. And they said, what do I do now? What should I do? How can I do better? The problem is not everyone responded to the gospel in that way. Over in Acts chapter 7, we read of a very similar sermon in context. We have the Christian Stephen, one of the very first uh, devoted Christians. He was, he was very passionate about preaching the gospel to the point where the Pharisees noticed him doing this work and they arrested him for it. And so he is on trial before the Pharisees. The men who were constantly trying to get Jesus killed hated what Jesus had to say. And Stephen also delivers a very difficult message for them to hear. One that confronts them on their, on their hypocrisy. One that points out that they were the people who had been killing the prophets before and you did it again with killing Jesus. A very similar thing that Peter said to the people in Acts chapter 2 but the Pharisees' response is very different because they were not open-minded and they didn't listen to what Stephen had to say. So looking down at verse 54 of Acts chapter 7, let's see the response of the Pharisees. Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. So after Stephen finishes his sermon to the Pharisees, calling them out on their sin, how did the Pharisees respond compared to the people in Acts 2? They weren't pierced to the heart in the same way. They weren't open. They didn't ask, what do we do? But rather, their response, as we see, is, is much like a child. They cover their ears so they can't hear him. They yell over Stephen, and they rush him, and they kill him so he can't say anything anymore. They were complacent in where they were. They were not looking to change. They did not listen. And because of that, they remained in their sinful lifestyle. So my question is to you, how are you going to respond to confrontation? Are you going to be like the people in Acts 2 who listen and ask, what do I do now? Or are you going to be like the Pharisees who cover their ears and don't look for the problem at all? Let's say you're, you're with the first group, the group that listens. What's, what's the next step then? What do we do? Well, we have to let go of all of the habits all the problems, all the things that hold us back from accomplishing our goals. Let's go back to the book of James. And let's continue reading. Back in James chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 21 again. James writes, Therefore, reading yourselves of all moral filth and the evil as, that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The key word that, that we should really be paying attention to here is to remove all wickedness, all filth from our lives in order to change. I think that's where we really fall short right there, is removing everything that holds us back. We might uh, make the effort to remove most of our sinful problems, most of our bad habits, most of the things that hold us back from moving forward, but there are some things that we try to hold on to because we, we like it, or it makes us uncomfortable to let it go. We've lived with it so long that we struggle to let it go. But in order to better ourselves, we need to be completely transformed, not just partially. Last time I was here, we, we read from Romans chapter 12, and verse 2, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We need to make a full transformation. We can't conform to the world. We can't keep some things from our previous life. But we need to fully devote ourselves to God and not hold on to anything that keeps us back. Because there are times where we might try to convince ourselves that we don't have that kind of problem. Or we wonder why we keep falling short of our goals. 
when that bad thing is still right there in our lives, we might try to say to ourselves, oh, it's, that's not the problem. That's not what's creating the issue. Or we might say, that's not as big of a deal as it is, but it really is. If we're holding on to bad things, they're going to keep us from fully transforming as God wants us to. Go over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, we read about a man with this very problem. I'm going to start reading in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 19. It says, Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? He said to him. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, and do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, Go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. So we, we read of a young man who comes to Jesus seeking eternal life, seeking what Jesus has to offer. He comes with good intentions. Lord, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus tells him exactly what he needs to do. He says, Follow these commandments. Do the right thing. Do good. And what is his response? I've, I've done all those. What else do I lack? Jesus tells him exactly what he's lacking. He says, sell your possessions. Give them away and follow me. And yet he was unable to do that. He came seeking good. He came wanting to move forward and do the right thing, but he left grieving. Why? Because he couldn't let go. There was something holding him back from approaching Jesus, from receiving eternal life, his possessions. And he was unable to let that go because he cared so much about it. There was a book I was reading a few years ago called The, the Great Divorce. By, by C.S. Lewis. It's a very profound book, um, a novel where the, the main unnamed character is having a dream and he's going through having these different interactions with people in his dream of the afterlife. And in these conversations he's having with them or there these people are having with other people or spiritual beings, he points out different things that keep people from approaching God, keep people from moving forward and in one of the last chapters, there's a, there was a very, very impactful story to me of a, a man having this conversation with a, a spiritual being. And the spiritual being is trying to help him go and approach God, trying to help him to do better. But he can't. Because on his shoulder is a, is a little salamander, a little lizard representing sin. And the, the spiritual being is saying, give me the lizard. Give that up. Give it to me so you can keep going. And he's holding on to that lizard for dear life. He won't let it go, even though he knows it's for the best. And it takes a long time for him to eventually give that up. And when he's able to, he's able to be transformed and move forward. That's very similar to what James is saying here. In order to be transformed, in order to move forward, we need to let go of that lizard. We need to let go of what we're holding on to that's holding us back and move forward. Let go of all the bad things and be transformed by the word of God, what is good. And once we're able to do that, we need to look at the, the last thing here, the, the hardest statement that I think James gives us, which is we need to put in the work, put in the labor to accomplish these things. Let's go back to the, the book of James and finish out this section here. We're going to start reading in verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. When we're wanting to make change, when we're wanting to break habits or build good ones, we need to put in the work to do it. We can't just sit 
and expect things to change without us doing anything. God wants us to put in the work. Oftentimes, we commit ourselves to wanting to get this done, wanting to make change, but we're not committing ourselves to doing the work. We're not factoring in that there's work for us to do. Oftentimes, we're like the man that James brings up here, where we look into a mirror, we see that there's a problem, we understand it, but then we go away and don't do anything about it. He, he looks in the mirror and he's like, maybe your hair's messed up a little bit in the back, or you've got something in your teeth, something that you can do about it, something that you could change, but you go away and don't do anything about it at all. Or to give you a much more deeper spiritual example, someone who comes into church one morning, sits down, and he hears a sermon that speaks exactly to what he's been struggling with. And he's given a solution on how to fix it, what he needs to do. And he tells himself, I, I should do that. I need to be doing that. That's the answer I've been praying for and looking for. Then he leaves the church building and doesn't do anything about it. I've, I've done that many times, too many to, to count, really. Where I've heard a powerful sermon that really impacts me, but I don't put in the work to do what I was told. I don't act out the solution that was given to me. We need to be able to put in the work Make the plan. Seek out opportunities to better yourself. Look for ways to improve yourself. Put in the work to do it. The two things that I, we've talked about already, the first two steps, those aren't easy. It's not easy to listen to someone who is confronting you and telling you difficult things. It's not easy to let go of the bad things that hold us back, the things that we've lived with for so long. And yet we need to put in the work to do it. And I think the, the biggest... Uh, killer of momentum and motivation in this is procrastination. At least for me personally, that is. I, I think of going back to my example at the beginning, like working out at the gym. I would wake up sore in the morning, like I'll do it tomorrow. I, I, I'm going to do it eventually, but I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Today, I'm just going to rest. And then tomorrow comes and I said the same thing. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. It'll get done eventually, but not today. And we keep telling ourselves that. We keep putting it off, and not making it a priority. Brothers and sisters, we should not do that with such serious things like spiritual matters in our soul. We should not push off things that we can do today, important things. But we should do the work and do the work today. So if there's something that you're, you're struggling with right now, and you've been meaning to, to make change and make the effort, do it today. Don't, don't wait. Why wait? Do the work today. And I know nothing I said this morning is easy. And we're not going to do it perfectly. Your life isn't going to completely change 100% when you leave the doors today. And there are going to be times where you're going to fall short still. Even though if you're putting in all the work, doing all these steps, we're still human and we're still going to fall short and fail. But, but praise God for our Savior Jesus, who he sent to die for us that we might have grace so that when we do fall short, when we do still fail, we can lean on that grace. Know that we are forgiven so we can get back up and keep going. No matter how many times we fall, how many times we fail, we have to keep up and still work at it. Still work towards our goal. Still work to better yourself every single day. And so if you're sitting there this morning and you haven't given your life to God, but you're wanting to make that change, you're wanting to, to trust your life to him, be baptized, and receive that grace to be transformed spiritually and live for him. You could be baptized today and start that walk. If there's uh, anything we could pray for you about, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know what we can do as we stand and sing this song.